This rather battered old faux alligator skin case houses one of Singer's best-selling portable machines, the 99. I've just picked this up from eBay, and I'm going to show you what I do with most machines that come into my possession. The Singer 99 is mechanically the same as its bigger sister, the 66, so you can follow these steps on the 66 too. This is an electric machine, so before I plug it in, I'm going to check the cable for any cracks, splits or bad wires. This is an old rubber covered cable, so I will replace that soon, but I want to be able to check that the machine works. It's important to check the plug. Here in the UK, our plugs are fused, and a sewing machine should have a fuse no greater than 3 amps. They often get replaced with a 13 amp fuse, which can be dangerous. Check it and change it if needed. I've taken the screws out of the foot pedal to see if there's a capacitor inside. Some of the rubber feet are disintegrating so I'll have to replace them. Luckily they are still available. There's no capacitors in here. If there was, it would bridge between the two wires and I would remove it. Often old capacitors blow, sometimes with a bang, and cause the machine to run at full speed without touching the foot pedal. There's no need to replace the capacitor, as they were only there to suppress interference on old analogue TV sets. I'll put a link up in the top right hand corner to a more in depth video about servicing and maintaining the foot pedal. Now to check the belt, and this one, while old, seems to be fairly good with no cracks. I'll take a close look at it later. While I'm here, I'll take a look at the cable to the lamp. I check that everything moves ok by turning the handwheel towards me. Always towards you, never back. That can cause thread jams, and it's a good habit to get into. Plug the power lead and foot pedal into the machine, and then the machine into the mains. For safety, I always plug into a circuit breaker. I check the light, and it works. Then I slowly begin to operate the machine. You can hear that the machine is in need of oil and that the belt is a little stiff and squeaking. But there's good control from the foot pedal. Next I'm going to remove the machine from the base. Just tip it back and loosen the grub screws that hold the machine to the hinge pins. Then it should just lift off. You may need an extra pair of hands to help you here. I like to use a cheap turntable with an old plastic tray to work on. The turntable means you can move the machine around easily and the tray will catch any small screws and later any drips of oil. I'm going to start to take it apart. Starting with removing the presser foot. Remove and discard the needle. Then take off the needle clamp. Take out the bobbin. I store these in a series of cheap plastic food tubs. To remove the bobbin plate, lift the inner edge and pull up and towards the feed dogs. Remove the screws from the feed dog cover with good quality hollow ground screwdriver tips. I use a ratchet driver as they are easier to fit in the small spaces. It can still be tricky at times. 
It's worth removing these as part of your general maintenance routine to get rid of any lint build up underneath. I use tweezers and a stiff brush to move the bulk of it. The red fluff you can see here is not lint and it's important you do not remove it. It's an oil wick and it should be oiled as part of your maintenance routine. It keeps the bobbin race oiled. Next take off the faceplate. Just loosen the screw at the top a little and then undo the thumb screw at the bottom and it will just lift off. Again, brush out any dust and lint. Now to remove the motor. Unscrew the motor mount at the back of the machine. These can be on tight. Once it's loose, slide it up and remove the motor belt before taking the screw completely out. Now I can get a proper look at the belt. Next I unscrew and remove the lamp. This can be awkward too because of the position of the screw. You can see there's years of grime under where the motor was. You can also see the cutout in the rear corner, indicating that this is a later machine. Now I'm going to remove the bobbin case. Use the screwdriver to lift the retaining finger out of its groove and to the right a little. Then wiggle the case out. Again, this can be fiddly if you've not done it before. And of course, I've managed to get my hand in the way. You can see a good build-up of dirt and dried oil on this case. I keep a jar of isopropyl alcohol for soaking the shiny metal parts, and I'm going to drop in the bobbin case along with any other grubby metal pieces, and that can sit for a day or so. Don't get isopropyl alcohol on the black finish or it will destroy it. Next to remove the hand wheel. Loosen the grub screw in the stop motion knob, but try not to take it right out. Unscrew the stop motion knob. and remove the stop motion washer. The hand wheel should just pull off, but this one's stuck, probably from a build up of old oil. I've decided to remove the belt guard and bobbin winder assembly to see if I can make more room to work with. This is held on by just one screw. And sure enough, it comes off. If it hadn't, I would have used heat from a hairdryer or a craft heat gun to soften the old oil. I unscrew and remove the bobbin winder thread guide. Again, you have a lovely view of the back of my hand. The tension assembly is held in place with a small grub screw on the right hand side.
I'm removing the presser foot pressure screw from the top, simply unscrewing it all the way. I've taken off as much as I'm going to on this machine. I'm using a stiff brush and a vacuum cleaner to get rid of any more dust and fluff. Some people like to use air in a can to blast it out, but this can blast lint further into the machine. Start with the bobbin area, then the underneath. I'm using original formula, no pumice swarfiga, to clean the painted part of the machine. A similar product is Gojo, without pumice, but that's not available in the UK. This is safe to use on later machines, but I recommend testing it on a small area on very old machines, just in case. I decant a spoonful into a small plastic tub, and apply it generously with a soft brush. Never use detergents or household cleaners or anything with water in. This will get under the finish and damage the decals. I like to leave the Swarfiga for about 10 minutes and then gently wipe it off with a piece of kitchen towel. Don't forget to clean the hand wheel and the belt guard as well. I've also used Swarfiga on the toolbox cover. Finally, use a piece of old t-shirt fabric to take the rest of the Swarfiga off. You can still see dirt's coming off. Sewing machine oil and cotton buds are ideal for cleaning the hard to get to areas like the bobbin race and inside of the faceplate area. I'm using Humbrol Gloss Black Modeler's Paint to touch up any noticeable chips in the finish. And I'm doing a dreadful job of it because the camera's in the way, but you can take more care. The hand wheel is also quite badly chipped, and it's getting the same treatment.
Once the paint is dried, I'm oiling every oiling point. In fact, I'm oiling anywhere where metal moves against metal. From the underneath to the bobbin area, making sure I oil the red wick. Then inside the faceplate, and the oiling ports on top. And the ones on the back. Anywhere really I can get oil. Finally, I take a cotton wool pad and generously wipe sewing machine oil onto the surface. Sewing machine oil is gentle and will clean the finish even further. I like to leave the sewing machine oil on for a day or two, so it feeds the finish. Join me in part 2 when I'll be polishing the machine and reassembling it. I hope you've enjoyed this video, if you have, please give it a like. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you won't miss any of my future uploads. Thanks for watching.